So we are continuing in this series, Close Encounters, as we look at these different moments when our massive, holy God comes close. And uh, there's these moments that we read about in the Bible with different people where God just shows up in this radical way, and he does it for a particular purpose, right? He's coming close to answer questions that they were wrestling with and questions that we often wrestle with still today in our lives, because sometimes these questions have the capacity to paralyze us in life and keep us from really growing the way that God longs for us to grow in this life with him. And so he breaks in to reveal himself more fully to us, who he is, not just in the lives of the people we read about, but I believe he wants to do that in our lives today. And so that's why we're looking at this. I do love that today is, is Father's Day, not just because, you know, my girls spoil me. That's, that's an added bonus, right? But uh, I think it's great that we get to celebrate the different men who, who have spoken into our lives, help shape us, help draw us to Jesus. But the greater truth that we get to celebrate today is that you and I belong to an ultimate Father. And I don't know what kind of earthly father you've had in this world, but nothing can compare to how great and good our Father is to us. Amen. And He just longs for the best for you and for me. And He's a Father who comes close to speak into our lives and to lead us and to share with us the truth of who He is and what He wants from us. And really that leads us into the question that we're going to look at today that I think most, if not all of us, have asked at one point or another, and it's this, what does God expect from me? Or maybe you've asked it a little bit differently, God, what do you want from me? Okay, so now just to set up what we're looking at today, I, I want to take us all back to English literature class in high school, right? Oh, I know, some of you just rolled your eyes, don't roll your eyes at me. That's disrespectful, right? <laughs> now, I get that there are two types of people in the world. There are those who love English lit, and then there are the rest of us, normal people, right? So if you're a big fan of English lit, okay, this part's for you. For the rest of us, just hang with me. Okay, but I have to say English lit is where I was exposed to books and works that I never would have read on my own, even if you paid me to do it, okay? So you've got your... Uh, you've got your Shakespeare classics, you know, Romeo and Juliet and, and Othello and Hamlet. That was just weird, right? So you've got those. You've got the, the fan favorite, I think, of everyone, The Grapes of Wrath by Steinbeck. Oh, right? Anybody else with me on just grunting over that book, right? Okay, some of you are there. The one I actually grew to like, you know, kind of like eating your vegetables until you finally like them, but one I grew to like was called Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Anyone else re read that book, Great Expectations? Some of you out there? Okay. So here's a spoiler. I'm, I'm going to give you the spoiler of, of, this, of this piece of work here, okay? Great Expectations. If you haven't read it, it's about the life, and you get to see this whole life unfold of, a, of what starts off as a boy named Pip, okay? And you get to see him grow all the way into his adult manhood, okay? As you work your way through, Pip wrestles with all kinds of, of great and really not so great expectations and demands and desires that are placed on him from other people. And he's wrestling with this. The, the work starts off and he's, he's an orphan. He's lost both of his parents. He's forced to move in with his sister and her husband and they're poor. And so immediately he has the expectation that he needs to earn his keep. Right? He, he can't live here for free. He has to earn his keep. Later on, we're introduced to the bitter Miss Havisham. That's a fun one to remember. And she places all kinds of bizarre and just unreasonable demands on Pip. Now, Pip wants to please her, regardless of the hoops she makes him jump through, because he believes she's responsible for this, this money that keeps appearing in his bank account from what we only know is an unknown benefactor. And he thinks it's her and so he wants to please her to keep the money flowing into his life. And so he's caught up in all these twisted and cruel and just manipulative games that she throws him through. Now, finally, Pip is able to kind of break free from that, and he enters into, into society, right, as a young man. But he wrestles with all kinds of new expectations of, of now who he can hang out with, 
and who he's got to avoid, maybe from his old life. Who, who's good enough to be around and, and who really isn't because there's this kind of caste system. He's got pressures on what he's supposed to do with his life. And then there's a struggle of, okay, so how do I use the money and the influence and the connections that I now have to help the other people in my life move forward, right? So he's trying to wrestle with all of this. And just when you think, man, everything's going great for him, he's going to settle into this good life, right? That's when, that's when everything begins to unravel. He learns that the money he's been receiving for free isn't from Miss Havisham, as bitter and warped as she is, but is actually from this escaped convict that he helped when he was just a young boy. And, and now there's all sorts of strings attached as this guy steps back into his life and demands that Pip help him in these really... Uh, harmful ways, right? And, and so he's going to help him escape and help him elude the authorities and things like that. On and on and on the story just unfolds, one after another, as Pip's life, man, is just driven to the point of exhaustion, and he's just careening back and forth, all under the pressure of these relentless demands and expectations that are being placed on him by other people. Now, I'm not a literary scholar to save my life, but I believe that that's the point of what Charles Dickens was trying to get across to us because I think Pip is supposed to be a mirror to me and you. Because I believe the truth Dickens is trying to share with us is, is this, that all of us wrestle with being driven by the expectations of other people that are placed on us. We have expectations and, and responsibilities placed on us at our jobs, we're told that there are certain things that need to be done in certain ways and in a certain time. And if you don't meet those things in those ways and in that time, well, there's trouble facing you. We have demands of family as we try to shuttle the kids around and we take care of the home and we pay the bills and we've got all of these different things on the calendar and we're trying to get from one place to another. All of these expectations and responsibilities placed on us. We have different groups and activities that we're involved in that ask us to give our time and our money and our resources and our commitment to help them accomplish certain goals and tasks that they have for us to do. Or we've got the expectations of friendships. You've got this balance of, of give and take, right? And, and it's good when you feel like there's a good balance. You're there for them, and they're there for you. Okay, but sometimes it's more of a strain, right? As you feel like, like you're always giving. You're giving time and, and energy and, and attention, and they're always taking, right? And now you've got the strain in this friendship we could go on and on and on about the different expectations that are placed on us, some that are realistic and some that are absolutely not, some that we want to fulfill, and others, man, where we just struggle to have a desire to get the thing done. And the truth is that we are a people that are driven by the expectations of others around us. We're driven to perform and to measure up, to achieve and to, and to earn and to be rewarded, and like Pip, it is easy, man, it is so easy to find our lives kind of careening around to be driven to exhaustion as we try to live up to the great and sometimes just not so great expectations of other people. And you know you've been there if you've ever sat in your home and you hear this knock at your door. Or you glance down at your cell phone and you see that somebody's calling you or that message comes in. Or you hear the kids call out, Mom! Dad! And that thought comes into your mind, now what do they want? Right? I think we've been there. Trying to live up to the expectations of other people can just be exhausting. Anyone else feel me in that? Right? Yeah. Anyone else there? Yeah, I see that hand, right? Okay. So now we've gathered into this place, and we're looking to God, and we celebrate all that He has done for us, and we remember how Jesus gave His life to set us free, and, and we've got eternal life because of Him. And then God moves even beyond just that salvation moment, and, and now He's providing for us, and He's blessing our life. His grace is just holding us through, through difficult times. Okay, now, it's easy in this moment to sometimes wonder, 
If God has done all of this for me, what does he expect from me in return? Or maybe today you find yourself just going through a really difficult time, and, and some of us are, right? And the struggle is immense, and the pain is just intense, and, and sometimes you just cry out, okay, God, what do you want from me, right, to, to make this go away? What, what would make you happy right now? What do you want from me? And we struggle, right? Because if we really wrestle to live up to the expectations of other people, how in the world are we going to live up to the expectations of God? I think we wrestle with this. So many times when we talk about God's expectations, I think sometimes we turn to different lists that God has given to us. Makes sense, right? And so maybe we open up and we look at the Ten Commandments. It's a great place to start. Or, or maybe you expand that out and you just look at the, the larger law that's given to us in the Old Testament, the Jewish law. Maybe we flip over to the New Testament and, and we read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount because he's there and, and he's opening things up and he'll say something like, you know, you've heard that, that it said that murder is wrong, right? And that's true, Jesus says, but then I tell you, and now Jesus raises the bar, right? He raises the expectation in the Sermon on the Mount of, of what, what we're to do, how we're to live. Maybe we, we look into the the, a little further in the New Testament, and we look at some of what the disciples of Jesus have written. We flip open to something that, that's written by Paul or, or John or, or Peter, right? And, and there in those letters, they give us lists and they give us guidelines of how we should live this new life with Jesus. And sometimes we even take those lists that we're given, and you know what? We add to them, and we create even more expectations over our lives. And and to be honest, there are periods in the church as a whole, and there are even times in, in our church history in particular where we have we've clung to these lists as the expectations of God, believing that, you know what, this is what God wants. See, this is what He expects, this is what He desires, this is what will make Him happy with us, is to do and to fulfill and to follow these lists, what we could call, I think, religious Practices. Let's just use that term, okay? These are lists of, of what we're to do and things that we are not to do in these religious practices. And, and we've tried to live up to these and we've tried to do enough to make God happy with us. And you know what? We've worn ourselves out in the process of pursuing religion and religious practices. And honestly, I, I don't ever believe that that was God's intention for you and for me. Now, I want to be careful because, man, there's good truth in, in all of those different lists that we were just talking about. All those lists, all those guidelines, there's good stuff all through that. The problem is not with the Bible. The problem is not with the list. The problem is how we approach them. In fact, I think we could put it this way, that, that all of these lists that we read about in Scripture are pictures of the result of life lived with Jesus. You with me? These are not more demands that God is placing on us. This is a picture of what life with Jesus is supposed to look like. Okay, And this belief that God has placed this heavy burden and, and these lists are just regulations to no end. He has these practices for us to fulfill. Right? That's really against what Jesus teaches us. In fact, this is, this is how Jesus puts it in Matthew chapter 11 beginning in verse 28, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened. And now when Jesus says this, he is talking to people who are just tired of, of endless expectations being placed on them, right? Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Say that word rest with me. Rest. rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm humble in heart, and you will find what? Rest. Rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus promises rest, not a new list of expectations for us to fulfill to make him happy. In fact, just turn to your neighbor today and tell him, you, you just need to relax, right? Right? 
You just need to relax, right? We can find real rest in God. Isn't that good? We can find real rest in God. And that's part of the truth that that God wants to share with us today. Okay, but this now leads us to another question. Because if these lists are not God's expectations, then what does He want from us? Right? If God is not after religion and the fulfillment of religious practices, then what is He after? And some of you already know the answer. Right? It's why we tell people that we're Christians and that means we don't have a religion. We have a relationship. Because what God wants is a relationship with us. That is his expectation. That is his great desire. Okay? But not in the sense of something that is going to wear us down. According to Jesus, and, and really this is the larger point of what we're looking at today, God, God is not after the performance of religious practices. In fact, here's kind of the main point of today. We can find rest in God because what God wants is a relationship with us. That's what he wants. Okay? Now here's the question. What does that look like? And, and there is this massive, man, it is this massive close encounter moment where God shows us this. And, and the one I want us to look at is actually one of the first close encounter moments that, that God gives between us and him. And it takes place in this paradise garden that we call Eden. Now before we jump into this, let me just catch you up to speed on where we are. Okay, so we need to actually back up all the way to the beginning of everything, okay? And in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Now, as we step through the days of creation, let me just give you the cliff notes of, of Genesis chapter 1 here. God creates, he creates sky, and he creates land, and, and then God makes the sun and, and the moon and, and a billion stars. He just speaks and they appear. He breathes out these stars. I mean, that's how massive our God is. He creates vegetation, right? Bushes, trees, plants, grass, and, and so much more. And, and then God speaks, and, and animals appear, and, and they're in the water, and they're in the sky, and, and then he makes them on land. And, and then finally, we get to day six, where there's this moment, and, and God makes us. Okay. You see all of that in Genesis chapter 1. As you head into Genesis chapter 2, it's almost like God says, that was a great overview. That's like a drone footage, right, to see everything in this picture of what he's showing us. But then he takes the camera and he zooms up close to show us how he creates you and me. How he didn't just speak us into existence like he does everything else. But, but here God carefully forms us. He comes close enough to kiss us and to breathe life into us, and we become alive in Him. God's not finished, though, and so He blesses our lives, and He gives us responsibility. He says, rule over creation. He gives us honor. He says, I know all of this is mine. I'm giving it to you. As He places us above the rest of all of His creation. Beyond that, He, he gives us these, these amazing gifts of marriage and and family, right? It is this amazing paradise. But as we move into chapter 3, we know what happens. It's the story of our fall from God's paradise and God's perfect plan into temptation and sin. Adam and Eve, they, they, they take this forbidden fruit, and really it's a whole lot more than that. It's this move where they push off from God, seeking to become gods of their own. And so they take this fruit and they move against God and, and suddenly their eyes are open and they experience sin and shame for the first time and they move to cover up from each other and also from God. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 3. Verse 8, and this is what we read. They heard the sound of the Lord God in the garden. He's walking to them in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves 
from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now just pause there. I get that this is in the middle of a really messy moment in our history and our story. But this verse captures the heart of what God wants, not just from us, but what God wants for us. Okay? Now let me show you what I mean by that. Adam, the first man, Eve, the first woman, they hear the sound of God walking through the garden. They knew what that sounded like because this wasn't the first time God showed up. In fact, I know it's hard for us to see this, but in the original language, the Hebrew word here tells us that this is something that God did every day. They knew that He was going to show up because God was consistent. God, our ultimate Father, was coming to hang out with us, His kids. Okay? I mean, can you even imagine? Can you even imagine how Adam and Eve were with God? I mean, every day they're just kind of strolling around through this garden paradise with themselves. But every evening, God arrives on the scene in the cool part of the day as the breeze is just kind of kicking the heat away. And they just get to walk with God and and they're shooting the breeze with Him. They're hanging out with God, asking Him every question on the face of the planet, right? And, And this is God's dream. Because all God wants is a relationship with us, all right? And and not just any kind of relationship, but a relationship where we can find rest in Him, okay? Now, it's here in this close encounter garden moment that God shows us what this looks like, what He expects, what He wants for us as much as from us, okay? So let's open this up. Adam and Eve, like I said, they're in the garden. They hear the sound of God. He's coming to hang out with them, and he's calling out to them. And in this moment, we're told that Adam and Eve hid from the presence of God. And again, I get that we're looking at this moment as we fall into sins after our fall. Okay, but what you need to know is that Adam and Eve are now responding to God in a way that they have never responded to him before because that's what sin does. It, it warps our response to God. But God is unchanging. He is the same yesterday and today and forever. And God's desire for relationship with you and with me, it is unchanging. And God's moving towards us that he seeks us out. That is unchanging. Aren't you thankful for that today? And so this is why God still comes to the garden, even though he already knows what Adam and Eve have already done. He's unchanging. And while we celebrate that, what's even more incredible is how God comes to visit with them. The Bible tells us that in kind of this cryptic way, that it's the presence of God that that shows up in the garden. So what does that word mean, right? Literally, that word presence that we translate means face, means face. Now, here's what may be a little bit puzzling. You might have your Bible open in your lap and you're staring on the screen and the verses don't quite match because many of our English translations drop the word presence because they think it's redundant. And it really doesn't sound like a big deal, right? Adam and Eve hid from the presence of the Lord God, or Adam and Eve hid from the Lord God, right? It doesn't really sound like there's a big difference there until you realize what that word presence means, that God is showing up for this face-to-face encounter. That's what he's showing us here. No barriers, no obstacles, no masks, no veils, no pretense, no pretending. It's just God, and it's just them. I mean the real God and the real them face-to-face. And this is where God starts to reveal the truth to us, right? That what He wants and what He's after and what He expects in this relationship is a relationship where we can be fully real. A relationship where we can be fully real. We can, we can let down our guard and we can be open and we can be vulnerable. No barriers, no masks. A relationship where we can rest in Him. Now, I get that this is pretty basic stuff. I mean, this is what we would call Christianity 101, right? That God longs to have a relationship with us where we can be absolutely real. But sometimes, I don't think we really remember all that God has done to make this happen. It is a massive deal that God has opened up for us, that He's invited us into, right? So let's just look at this. 
Because in this moment with Adam and Eve, after they, they pluck and they eat that fruit and they push off from God, they move against Him, in that moment, everything shifts from God's dream into this distorted view that we now live in. Right? The world that you live in is not normal. Yeah, that should have been a big amen point right there, right? <laughs> All of a sudden, yeah, I get that, right? It is not normal. Right? It shifts the entire story of humanity and God and what God had purposed for our lives. No longer do we get to enjoy this face-to-face -face relationship, but Adam and Eve show us what we always do. They ran from God, and they hid from God, and they covered up from God as they're trying to, I don't know, duck behind bushes so that God won't see them, right? Don't mock them because we do even sillier stuff. From that point on to today, there was now this distance between us and God. There's this rift, this chasm that we call sin, okay? And we can no longer stand in the presence of God. We can no longer approach Him the way that He wanted and have this open, face-to-face -face kind of relationship. Because of us, God's dream was shattered. And so for the rest of the Old Testament, well, while God keeps reaching out to us and keeps calling to us, man, it's just not the same. Instead of face-to-face -face walking through life, now God moves in dreams and visions, right? Instead of speaking directly to His people and, and having conversations with them, now God has to speak through a prophet who then goes to the people. There's always this intermediary step, right? And even when God decided, you know what, I'm going to move in with my people... He had to give instructions of how to create this elaborate tabernacle and then this elaborate temple, right? And, and there's all kinds of restrictions on who can go where and, and how far away you got to stay from it and, and who can approach what. And, and inside, there's even places that are like off-limit zones, like you cannot go beyond this point. It, it, the Holy of Holies, for example... Right, this, this place where God's presence touched the earth, where he dwelt with his people, man, it is shielded by this thick curtain. You can't see through it. You can't see around it. And there's this distance. Because of sin, there's this distance. And for us to now see the face of God means certain death. For thousands of years, there was now this separation between God and us. But God couldn't stand it. And so now he breaks into history in this brand new way, and this person that we call Jesus. It's the full presence of God somehow contained in the body of a man. We can't wrap our brains around that. But when you look at Jesus, this is what you have to see. It's the full presence of God that's hanging out with 12 ordinary guys who kind of flunked out of high school. Okay, that, that's who he's hanging out with. That's who we call the 12 disciples. It, it is the full presence of God that is seeking out people. That, God, you probably don't want to hang out with these people. I mean, these are the scoundrels of society that he's hanging out with at parties. He, he's healing lepers who are shunned and, and shoved away. He's healing diseases of people who other people have forgotten about. Oh, you remember that guy? Yeah, he's been laying there for years. What's his name? I don't know. I walk past him every day. Jesus heals him. He's freeing people from, from demonic holds over their lives. I mean, God in his fullness his presence in Jesus is searching out all of these people and he's trying to lift them out and bring them into a face-to-face -face relationship with him. It is this radical return to the dream and the desire and the expectations of God. And in his death and in his resurrection, man, Jesus does even more because this is what we're told, that that, that veil that was in the temple that separated us from the presence of God, that God rips that thing from top to bottom himself. As Jesus died on the cross for our sin. Right? And in Jesus, and because of Jesus, God has now crossed and God has now closed the rift between us and Him. And He has opened up this way for us to once again have this face to face relationship with Him. And now, through Jesus, we have access to the Father by one. Holy Spirit. Amen. And because of Jesus, 
we can now approach the throne of God with all confidence. And that word confidence, we've talked about it before, means we can be real. We can be ourselves in front of God so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And while we still may have some limitations because you and I still live in a sin-scarred, sin-filled world, God's not finished. And one day, when Jesus Christ appears, we shall be transformed to be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I mean, I'm talking face-to-face people. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. No barriers, no obstacles, no hiding, no masks, no veils. It's just the real God and the real us fully open. God has done all the work necessary to make this way for us to live face to face with Him. Aren't you thankful for that today? Amen. You know what? We can let down our guard. And we can just rest in Him. And we can be real. Hmm. I know I spent a lot of time there. I just I think that's important. God's expectations, God's desire for us, it begins right here with a relationship that's real. But He also wants more for us. Now, to see that, I want us to get back into Genesis. So get back there with me. We're going to go to the end of chapter 2, the very last verse Because there we find the sentence that that really captures God's picture of perfection and paradise, right? And so this is what we read. Adam and his wife Eve were both naked, and they felt no shame. Really, we've already touched on, on that first word, naked, and what that's driving at and what we were just looking at before, right? It's this particular Hebrew word. That's used here in just a few other places. That is all about being real and being open, right? No barriers. And so Adam and Eve, they, they've got absolutely nothing between themselves, right? There's no separation there. There's nothing that they're hiding behind. And they have nothing between them and God. That's what this word is driving at. They're absolutely open, fully real with Him and, and with each other. And before sin enters the world, this is also what we're told, they felt no shame. He felt no shame. Now, after sin enters the world, it's a completely different picture, right? Then we're told that their eyes were opened and that they see that they're naked. It's a different word. It means to be exposed. And immediately because of sin, they feel shame and they begin covering up, right? They begin hiding because shame, it is this powerfully negative force in our lives, So many times when we, um, we see that word shame or we read that word shame, I think sometimes we view it as, as maybe the temporary embarrassment or humiliation, right? So, so we're doing something and maybe we mess up or maybe we fall and trip in front of people or we do something really foolish and, and we get caught, you know, other people see us and they whip out their phones and they try to capture you in that moment, right? Mm-hmm. And you feel exposed and you feel ashamed and you turn all shades of red, right? And I was told that that's like a stop sign to say, stop looking at me, right? I don't know. You feel ashamed, and eventually we get over it, and life goes on, and we have a good laugh about it later, right? And the Bible talks about that kind of temporary shame, but that's not the word that's used here. It's a different word here. In the Hebrew language, it's a deeper shame that's being talked about. Not a shame that makes you blush, but a shame that makes you pale. Because deep shame is not like momentary embarrassment. Deep shame is like this disease or this parasite that just grows inside of you. The longer you carry it, man, the more weak and sick and anemic you become. And it just drains the life out of you until your life is a pale reflection of what you used to be. Here's another way that the Hebrews describe 
this deeper shame. Picture a well in the desert. At one point, this well, man, it gave life with its cool, refreshing water. Okay, but something happened, and, and this happens a lot in that area. There's a seismic shift, and, and the well that once produced water, that once had this flow from this underground river, right? Because of that shift, it's now cut off from that life-giving flow, and, and it dries up. You put down your bucket to get water, but all that comes up is dirt, debris, dust. A dry well in the desert, man, that is not a good thing. And uh, so here's the message. Shame, it makes us sick. It drains the life out of you as anxiety and fear overtake you. What if, what if other people knew what was going on? Would they still accept me? Depression takes root in your life. Man, there's no hope. I'm always going to carry this with me. Right? And it just sucks you down. Shame makes us like an empty well. Right? It's a major deal that rocks our world and it blocks us. It cuts us off from the flow of God's love into our lives. It doesn't block God, but we're putting up the barricade here because we're holding on to the shame. Okay? And if we refuse to deal with it, if we engage in the cover-up, we isolate ourselves from God, we isolate ourselves from other people, oh, and we become dried up and dried out. Shame is this powerfully negative force in your life and mine. Amen. Okay, but here's the truth I don't want you to miss. God doesn't want your life or mine to be filled with shame. Instead, what He wants is a relationship where we are free. Where we are free. Where we're free from anxiety and worry and, and fear of where we stand with Him or, or what other people might think because we know, you know what, I'm covered by God's love. And that's enough. We're free from the pain of rejection because we find ourselves in Him fully accepted. We're free from feeling alone because, because now He's pulled us in and He's wrapped us up and He's pulled us into His forever family. We've been adopted as His son and His daughter. We're never alone. We're free from depression as, man, He just comes and He fills our lives with His life and His spirit and His joy and His peace. God wants this amazing relationship with you and with me where we are absolutely free. And instead of just struggling beneath the load of shame in our lives, we can now oh, breathe. We can let that go. And we can rest in Him and His love for us. And we can be fully free. I just want you to hear that truth today. Because God's expectations for your life and mine, man, it is not this, this pile of rules and, and regulations that we have to, to bear, right? It's this life with Him, this awesome relationship with Him. That's, that's what He wants for you. He's not after you to perform in a certain way. He, he's not about the struggle to just try to measure up to Him. His expectations for your life should never drive you to the point of exhaustion. He is our good Father who only wants the best. For us. And his greatest desire is that you and I, that we all would just step into this amazing relationship with him. Where you walk with him through life. I mean, every day you get to spend time with him. It's this face-to-face -face relationship where you can just, oh, I can be real, right? He's made out, he's carved out this shame-free zone in this life with him. Because of Jesus and his life and death and his resurrection, we can now step into this full freedom because in Jesus we find forgiveness and in Jesus we find healing and in Jesus we find the restoring of our souls, right? In him we find this deep rest. We can find rest in God. Because all God wants is just a relationship with us. Yeah. Maybe today you are hearing that 
and you're hearing Jesus calling you for the first time. And what an awesome day to just begin that relationship with Him. To turn to Him on Father's Day and say, I, I want you to be my father. I want to be your kid. And I want to step out of being all alone and I want to step into this life in your family where I know that I'm saved, I'm forgiven, I receive all of that and I acknowledge my sin to you and I invite you to lead my life. Today is an awesome day to begin that. Right? Maybe today you just need to draw close to Him, close to your Heavenly Father, and you just need to rest in Him. You just need to open up and be real about what's going on in, in your life. You just need to pour out your heart to Him and let Him just hold you. We have a Father today whose arms are wide open, and He's inviting us to draw close to Him. And I just want to encourage you to turn to Him, look to Him, draw close to Him, and find your rest in Him.